So good morning. <clears throat> Uh, we are back to, to the problem of uh, cosmic reionization that we uh, started. So this will be uh, the second lecture uh, in which we will concentrate on the uh, basic uh, physics of, uh, the, the, of reionization and also we'll spend some time discussing uh, what are the possible sources of reionization and what could be the uh, specific signature that we can look uh, in order to understand uh, what is driving realization, what has been the, uh, the, the, the power in terms of ionizing photons and eating of the intergalactic medium. Just uh, before I start, just a brief recap of what we have seen yesterday. So yesterday we spent uh, the first lecture by um, discussing the, uh, in the general properties of the intergalactic medium. Remember that uh, cosmic realization is exactly, uh, is actually the, the uh, process that uh, brings the intergalactic medium that is diffuse matter from uh, a neutral state in which it was left after recombination uh, at the, at the uh, last scattering surface of the CMB into an ionized uh, state. Uh, and uh, so what, what, we are, what we have been seeing is that um, a, a large fraction of cosmic baryons are residing not in galaxies, but they are residing in the intergalactic medium up to more than 90% of redshift, uh, about four or five. Uh, and then gradually uh, this gas uh, is heated by both uh, photoionization heating. Remember, we have uh, derived uh, how the uh, radiation is absorbed by, by uh, neutral hydrogen, which gets ionized and heated, but also is heated by shocks due to structure formation at later times. Now, this, this, uh, this second process is not... Uh, uh, directly related to realization because it has more to do with the structure formation, but it produces the same ionization and eating that that realization, that photoionization produces. So uh, at the end of the lecture, then we we have, uh, in addition to the discussion of the of the general properties of the uh, distribution uh, of the of the gas in terms of the column density of the observers and the temperature of the observers of the uh, absorbers. Uh, we have also uh, introduced the, uh, a way to study the, uh, the realization, which is the standard way based on quasar absorption line spectra. And the spectra uh, are interpreted in terms of uh, the so-called uh, Gamm-Peterson opacity, so the uh, opacity due to scattering of, uh, of UV photons by intervening uh, neutral hydrogen atoms that scatter the, uh, the photons away from the line of sight due to the resonance scattering of the Lyman alpha. So uh, we have seen that the Gamm Peterson uh, opacity uh, evolves with redshift, and we have seen that after a smooth growth that is mostly drive, driven by the increase of de mean density of the cosmic gas, then at some point uh, steepens up uh, around redshift six or so, and that might or may not uh, signal the, uh, the uh, end of realization, so where the interface, where the gas completely start uh, to become uh, ionized from a neutral state that they had before. So this is uh, an hypothesis so far. So now we have to put this on, on more uh, theoretical grounds and try to understand uh, from basic principles what we do expect in terms of realization and uh, for uh, the, uh, all the properties that characterize this process. So let's start uh, very simple. So uh, studying realization is, uh, is equivalent to uh, understanding basically uh, how uh, ionization fronts produced by radiation from, from sources propagates into, into the uh, surrounding uh, medium. Okay, so uh, this is a, a standard problem, not only, uh, of course, uh, in cosmology, but it also has been studied uh, in, in a number of contexts, not, not uh, late as the, the, the uh, H2 region, the ionized region around uh, massive stars. So uh, the theory is well, is well uh, settled. Uh, the, the difference here is that 
uh, when, when uh, applying this theory to uh, the theory of ionization fronts to uh, cosmology, we have to keep in mind that uh, we are, the universe is expanding and therefore uh, the density of the universe is changing with time. And of course that introduces an extra term in the equation. So let's, let's see what the basic equation says. Okay, so this is, uh, suppose you have a single source embedded into uh, otherwise homogeneous background of gas. Uh, and so if, if we work first in, in physical coordinates, something that we would do uh, in, in non-cosmological uh, situations. So we have a, a VP, which is the proper volume that uh, is ionized, that contains the ionized uh, gas. So sometimes this is called as an ionized bubble or uh, an H2 region. There are different names, but they all mean the same thing. So uh, the, this volume with time, as the central source continues to inject uh, ionizing photons, I recall you that this has to be photons with energy larger than one Rydberg, so 13.6 electron volt. So this volume is expanding, it's becoming larger. Uh, so let's, this is the, the first term that uh, on the left hand side expresses the, the change, the fractional change in the, uh, on the volume as a function of time. Uh, and you see that uh, the Hubble constant here enters uh, just to express the fact that the universe is also expanding. So in some sense, this is uh, an extra term that would not appear in a static, uh, in a static universe. Uh, NH here is the mean density of hydrogen atoms at, uh, at, at the, in, in the volume. And then we have uh, a source and a sink term. So the source term is the uh, rate at which the uh, central source produces photons and uh, injects them into the surrounding gas. Uh, and so N gamma, we'll see what the expression is in a, in, a, in a moment. But for now, this is just the production rate of ionizing photons. And we have then an extra term here, which is a sink. So that, that uh, works against the, against the expansion of the of the ionized volume, uh, and this is the product of, of three terms, alpha B, alpha B, which is the uh, recombination coefficient at the, uh, in the, what is called the case B recombination. Case B recombination uh, includes all, recomb in, excludes the uh, recombination that go directly to the ground level. And this is because in that case, if you recombine an atom to the ground level, that would emit another ionizing photons that would be absorbed anyway. So you, you exclude that case, the, the ground level, and this is called case B recombination. So case B recombination sums the uh, recombination coefficient on all levels from two to infinity. So uh, this is the recombination coefficient in the case B. Uh, uh, VP is the volume that we have just de defined in proper units. And uh, we have then here a term which expresses the, the variance of the, um, of the uh, neutral hydrogen density. So why do we care about the variance? Well, uh, this, sometimes this is called uh, the clumping factor. So the clumping factor uh, tries to uh, include in the equation the fact that you may have inhomogeneities in the, in the gas, right? So it's, uh, the fact that the gas is not perfectly smooth, perfectly homogeneous, but it's somewhat inhomogeneous. And so you try to uh, condense all this information into uh, a quantity which is called the clumping factor which is nothing else than the variance of the, of the uh, density field divided by the mean square. So this is called the clumping factor and gives you an idea uh, that, uh, of, the, of the clumpiness of the, of the gas. Of course, is the, for a perfectly smooth gas, then clumping factor would be uh, equal one. Now, uh, the, uh, the, we can then uh, do the next step and uh, move in uh, somewhat more uh, convenient coordinates that are the co-moving coordinates in which we factor out the expansion of the universe. And as you see, of course, as a result of that, uh, we are now turning to a V, which is the co-moving volume, and the uh, expansion term has dropped off. 
Um, and at the same time, we have uh, an A cube appears here. In a way, expansion is still there, but the scale factor now appears explicitly into, into the evolution of the density. And we have NH naught, which is the mean density, uh, is the co-moving mean density, or if you prefer, the density of uh, hydrogen at uh, regime zero. Now, this is a, a relatively simple uh, differential equation that can be solved uh, in, uh, uh, analytically, essentially. So we can find a solution for the evolution of the volume as a function of time. Uh, and you simply uh, find uh, the, uh, uh, an integral that uh, depends also on this exponential. And the exponential contains essentially the uh, evolution of the clamping factor and the scale factor uh, as a function of time. Because as the, as the universe expands, the density decreases, and therefore also the recombination rate uh, decreases. Because remember that uh, this, the, the recombination time scale is inversely proportional to the density. So as the universe expands, the density drops, and the recombination becomes less and less efficient. Okay? So, but in principle, you have a formal solution. So you can describe exactly how the uh, volume uh, of the ionized uh, bubble uh, evolves with time uh, in, a, in a very uh, precise manner. Now, this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the basic theory for uh, an expanding H2 region uh, in, a, in a cosmological context. But uh, let's do a, a next step then. So sometimes what we are really interested in, in, the, uh, in, in studying uh, reionization is the collective effect of many of these point sources, right? So we, don't, we are not interested in one single point source, but we are interested in the uh, cosmological effects on large scales in volumes that contain uh, thousands, if not uh, hundred thousand of sources. And so it is better to describe the, the process in a, in a similar but uh, somewhat different uh, way, which implies a statistical approach that uh, asks uh, exactly what is the fraction of a given cosmic volume that we take uh, appropriately large enough to be representative of the, of the whole universe. Uh, what is the fraction of such volume that is filled with uh, H2 regions or with ionized gas? So this is uh, called the, uh, this quantity Q, which is the ratio of uh, the sum of all the uh, H2 regions around individual sources divided by the volume that they are sampling. Uh, this is called the uh, volume filling factor. Sometimes it's also interchangeably uh, called the porosity factor. Even strictly speaking, the two things are not exactly the same, but they're almost the same. Anyway, so let's call it a filling factor. So it's the fraction of the volume that it's filled with gas. Of course, initially, uh, the filling factor would be zero because there is no uh, ionized gas around. And at the end of recombination, Q will be equal to 1, okay? because all the volume will be filled with uh, neutral hydrogen, or all, essentially almost 1. Now, we need to uh, introduce now, uh, we need to say something about the, the, uh, the source term of uh, ionizing photons. So in this statistical approach, uh, as we are dealing with uh, volumes that contain many, many sources, and uh, uh, these sources are essentially could be galaxies, could be quasars, could be even more exotic sources that we will discuss later. Uh, so we need to specify exactly what is the production rate of, uh, of photons uh, within, within this volume, the volume that we are studying. And so uh, what is <coughs> often done uh, the, uh, the assumption that we usually make, uh, or at least to a zero level, uh, is to say that the, the mean density of ionizing photons is proportional to the mean density of baryons that you have uh, in, that, in that volume with a, a coupling coefficient that it's the product of two things. So n ion, two quantities, n ion, which I'll discuss in a second, and the fraction 
of the baryons that are collapsed into, into nonlinear structures. Okay? So you, what you want to say here is that the amount of uh, photos that, that, that I uh, produce in a given volume is proportional to the density of baryons that, that I have in that volume. Uh, so, for example, an overdense region will produce more photons than an underdense region. But at the same time, uh, inside that volume, uh, uh, the disproportionality only holds for matter that is in collapsed structures. Okay? So, because we, want, we know that uh, both stars or quasar or, in general, uh, the, the more natural uh, ionization sources are uh, produced in regions of very high density where the gas has collapsed to form uh, I mean, bound structures like stars or even uh, black holes surrounded by accretion disks. So um, the fraction, we, we account for that by including this uh, F call, which is the fraction of the baryons that are collapsed in nonlinear structure. This is, you can, uh, it can be computed simply, for example, from, from uh, standard press check theory, if you know what it is, but I mean, it's a, it's a simple calculation that, that, that one can do as a function of redshift. And then there is another factor uh, there, that is the, uh, the number, uh, this is an ion, that is the number of photons that uh, I have available um, per baryon that I put into this collapse structure. Okay? So there are three steps. The first is how many, how many baryons I have in the volume, how many of them are collapsed, and how many photons do I get for each baryon that is in these collapsed structures. So that, of course, depends on it's where the property, the specific property of the source enters. Okay? Because in order to specify an ion, I need to know, I need at this point to specify, am I dealing with stars? Am I dealing with a quasar? If I'm dealing with stars, what type of stars am, am I considering? So this is all the astrophysics that, that comes in. This is the simplest possible model. I'm, I'm trying to be very pedagogical here. This is the simplest model of realization that we can uh, set up. But it gives reasonable results, as I'll show you in a second. So, so this... Uh, this N ion is the product itself of the number of photons that I produce per, uh, per baryon that I put into stars. Uh, for example, this is the case of stars, but could be a quasar, for example, here. Uh, times also another factor that says that not all the photons that are produced in the structure can get out of this collapse structure and go into the intergalactic medium. Remember that more than 95% of the barriers are in the intergalactic medium. So this is the, if you want to achieve ionization, we, we need to ionize this 95% of matter which is outside collapse structure. So the escape fraction uh, is, tells you how many of the, what fraction of the photos that I produce inside collapse structure can make it out into the intergalactic medium. This is where I want realization to happen. And we will discuss uh, during this lecture a uh, little bit more in detail all, all the intricacies of this term because this, of course, your final result will depend dramatically on, on the assumptions that you're making on this quantity. So it's important to understand them. But for a, for a second, uh, for, for the time being, right now they are just uh, for us are numbers. So we, ass some, we assume that somebody is, is giving us those numbers and we can use them uh, right away as free parameters. And so uh, this, is the, this is now the, the same equation that we had before, uh, but now instead of in terms of the volume that we have in the previous slide, now we write it in terms of the, of the volume filling factor, so the evolution of the filling factor, uh, and this is proportional to this uh, N-ion term times the evolution of the collapse fraction, and so this is again the production term, and this is the usual sink term once again. So uh, the 0.76, you may wonder why it comes out, is just the uh, abundance of uh, um, in mass of hydrogen, of course, because we are dealing only with hydrogen atoms, but they, they're also helium atoms, of course, to make uh, up the mass. So Q, again, uh, is a simple solution, so you, you find it uh, very easily uh, by solving that equation exactly as we did before, and so what do we get? Well. 
Uh, here is the, the, what I call the Hello World uh, reorganization model. So the simplest uh, reorganization model that you can do, which, you know, is not totally crazy. Actually, it makes sense. And uh, let's try to understand it from the physical point of view. So what I'm showing here is the uh, uh, evolution, well, this is the value of the feeling factor that, as I said before, goes from zero to one. One means that uh, we have achieved a full reorganization of the, of the, of the IGM, uh, and this is redshift, of course. Now, I plot here several curves. Uh, the first is uh, there are curves with varying uh, clamping factor. Remember that clamping factor that expresses the uh, inhomogeneities. Now, uh, I have four values that go from zero to 30. You may wonder why I'm considering C equals zero, which doesn't make sense. Uh, C equals zero uh, essentially uh, is equivalent to neglecting uh, the, the source term here, okay? Uh, sorry, the sink term, or neglecting recombination completely. It's like you have uh, only uh, the, uh, the source term with no recombination. So C equals zero would drop this term. And so it's a, it's a you know, maybe uh, extreme case, but just for, uh, for us to, to, I mean, to, to, to understand the physics, it makes sense to be considered. So you see that uh, from zero to one to 10 to 30, first of all, we know that the larger is the clamping factor, the larger is the amount of inhomogeneities we have in the gas. The more the gas is inhomogeneous, the later, the later uh, reionization occurs. Okay, and this is uh, easily understood because the, uh, this is the number of recombinations that you have in a gas depends on the square of the density. So if you increase the density locally or in inhomogeneities, these inhomogeneities are, 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 are sucking a lot of photons that uh, are only used to uh, co constantly ionize and recombine the gas. And so you waste a lot of photons in this inhomogeneity. So that delays, delays the process of reorganization. And in fact, you may see that uh, you, we are going from uh, essentially uh, what is that? Uh, f uh, a reionization that would occur at redshift 15 uh, for, for C equals zero to a reionization that would occur uh, at redshift six or, or so uh, for uh, a clamping factor of 30. <clears throat> now, uh, I've drawn a line here uh, which refers to redshift uh, 5.8, which is the minimum uh, the minimum redshift at which we know that realization must have ended. So this is the, uh, by, by the time you hit this line, you must be at one. So this is what data and the gun pieces that we have seen yesterday are telling us. So by 5.8, uh, we know that uh, the gas below that, below that redshift has to be fully ionized. So any solution which has not reached one, yes, and this is barely, uh, should be barely excluded, uh, it must be excluded. Yeah. So doesn't this uh, clamping factor change with time? As a result of yes, yes, yes. There's a, uh, your colleague is, is, uh, is, uh, is asking if, whether the, uh, the clamping factor of the IGM <laughs> may change uh, with time. And this is certainly true because uh, the more uh, collapse structure you're, you're producing, the more uh, obviously you, you, you uh, increase the, the uh, inhomogeneity of the gas. Uh, fortunately, um, we now, uh, well, this clamping factor is, is, uh, is, an unknown, is an unknown factor right now. Uh, we have some bounds and we have some uh, guidance from uh, numerical simulations that seem to indicate that a reasonable uh, value is of the order of three, okay? And it's not varying that much. Maybe it could vary between three and five, but it's not evolving very much. Of course, uh, the, the, the real problem is that uh, even with the, the best numerical simulations, uh, it's, a, it's a problem of scale, right? Because you can always have uh, more and more inhomogeneities on scales that you're not resolving. So it's very hard to, it's very hard to compute it uh, exactly, but we see a convergence with, the, uh, with increasing numerical resolution in the simulation. We see that there's a flattening that 
uh, does not increase dramatically as you continue to go to smaller scales. And so it seems to stabilize uh, around three or five. Okay? But we'll see later that <clears throat> we are starting to approach the problem, the, the, the key point that I want to make in this lecture, that cosmic realization has a number of free parameters that, that we don't know. Like this is a classical example. We have the clamping factor, which for us is very difficult to understand, uh, or even to model, even with the perfect supercomputer that we could imagine. Um, but uh, the, the only way in which we can fix these parameters and the only way in which a realization model can be believed is by constraining them with available data because we have a number of free parameters, but we also have a lot of very good data that we can use and matching the two uh, in a kind of semi or phenomenological approach, right? By matching theory with data, then you can hope to fix parameters on which, like the clamping factor, we have little handle. So it has to, it, any, any uh, theory of, of uh, theoretical model of realization has to satisfy at least a number of constraints that come from the data. And from them, uh, from, from that type of operation, then you may uh, trust uh, what you're finding. Otherwise, we are uh, running a little bit on, uh, un, in an unknown territory. Now, uh, so this is, as I said, this is the, the, simplest, the simplest model that we can, uh, that we can uh, think of. But as you can imagine, if you want to, have, uh, to, to go one step beyond that, you need <coughs> to do uh, something which is a little bit more uh, sophisticated. And in particular, uh, because the, uh, uh, because the, the uh, topology uh, of realization is so complex and inhomogeneities in the density field are present, a number of things. Uh, so essentially the only way to make uh, you know, uh, detailed models of realization is to do uh, radiative transfer calculations that has to be uh, numerical. Why, uh, why do they have to be numerical? Well, if you think for a second, what we want to know is just to uh, determine the intensity of the uh, radiation field produced by a, co a combination of a large number of sources. So in each position, you want to know exactly what is the radiation field that that atom is seeing as a result of the collection of all the uh, flux that is receiving from, <coughs> from, from the uh, surrounding sources. But the problem is difficult because this intensity, uh, J, uh, depends on uh, is a seven dimensional uh, function of time, three spatial coordinates, three angular coordinates, and uh, uh, sorry, sorry, two angular coordinates and uh, one and frequency. So uh, there are seven unknown variables, uh, and, and therefore it's uh, it's uh, it's a very complex uh, uh, problem to be solved. Uh, and but formally, this is the uh, radiative transfer equation that, that you would need to solve. Uh, again, we have a, a close parallel with the uh, non-cosmological uh, radiative transfer equation that you may have seen uh, during your courses. Uh, so the, the uh, evolution of, uh, of the intensity, uh, the specific intensity, it depends on frequency as a function of time, uh, in an expanding universe uh, as to, as to uh, as two more terms with respect to the standard two uh, of, of the uh, classical radiative transfer. So the first one is, uh, includes uh, or describes the effect of uh, red shifting of radiation. So as the, as the source is emitting a photon, uh, the photon is traveling, but the universe is expanding. So this photon gets red shifted as, as we know from, from, uh, from standard cosmology. Uh, and also, because of expansion, there is also the uh, energy density of the photons is also uh, diluted because the, it, the energy is now distributed in a larger volume. And then we have phenomena, more uh, microphysical phenomena like uh, the absorption of radiation, and which is described by uh, this absorption coefficient k nu which is the uh, absorption per unit mass, uh, sorry, per unit length of, uh, per unit path length of the radiation. And uh, we also need to take care of the fact that the, uh, the, the gas is also uh, emitting radiation uh, with a given emissivity epsilon. 
uh, which uh, depends on, on, on the, the physical process that are taking care, uh, that are taking place at that particular position. So what we can do is just to uh, find again, uh, there is a formal solution to this, to this equation, which is this, but it's not <coughs> much of, uh, of use because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an implicit solution that we can use directly. Uh, we can define, however, uh, a quantity, which is uh, the optical depth, which is the uh, integrated uh, absorption coefficient along uh, a, a path, CDT, uh, and also the frequency uh, redshifting, which is the standard, the, standard, uh, uh, the standard expression for redshifting of photons. Now, in the, we can make a, at least a simple approximation sometimes that we can uh, say uh, uh, that is called the local approximation. This local approximation holds all the times in which the mean free path of a photon is much smaller than the, than the Hubble radius. Now, remember that uh, K nu is the inverse of the mean free path of the, of the ionizing photons, and uh, H over C is the inverse of the Hubble radius. So whenever the uh, Hubble radius is much larger than the mean free path, then we can uh, have a, a simple uh, approximation that also uh, assumes a steady state uh, solution in which uh, J nu is simply uh, the ratio between the emissivity and the absorption coefficient. Now, uh, in order to, to solve or to make use of <coughs> this equation, as I said, uh, we need to, we need to uh, implement uh, this, this uh, radiative transfer equation into, into numerical simulation. And, and people have here uh, worked uh, a lot, uh, particularly in the last decade, to find uh, efficient methods to couple the uh, radiative transfer equation to the hydrodynamics of the gas. While the gas is evolving and the structures are forming, galaxies are forming, stars are forming and dying. And so uh, we need to couple these two problems. And uh, this is a terribly difficult, a terribly difficult problem. And many people have tried uh, different strategies to, um, to, to, to work on that. Uh, this, this, uh, simply this, this topic would require a course on its own, so I, I cannot cover uh, all the possible uh, uh, strategies in detail. But let me just give you at least you a flavor of what people are trying. So there are families of, uh, of uh, strategies that are being used to couple the, the solution of the radiative transfer equation to the hydrodynamics. And uh, the first two families are uh, using the idea of ray tracing. So what you do is just uh, you have a source and you solve the, uh, the radiative transfer equation in one dimension along each ray. Okay? So then you change your rays and you try to build up the 3D structure by shooting rays uh, in all in all directions. <clears throat> now, uh, this also comes into different flavors that depends if the uh, speed of light is uh, assumed to be infinite or not. That corresponds in some sense to a steady state or non-steady state solution. So these are the long and short characteristics. But <coughs> the basic idea is that you shoot rays and solve, reduce the dimensionality of the equation to 1D. Then there are other, uh, another family of, of uh, of solutions uh, have to do uh, by taking moments of the of the previous equation, exactly as we do in hydrodynamics when we build the mass conservation, momentum conservation, and so you take moments of the equation of uh, uh, radiative transfer that I showed you before, and and so you define uh, a number uh, of moments. Usually you go up to the second order, but then this thing needs uh, a, a closure relation because uh, each equation involves something, a, a moment of the uh, next order, so you, you cannot close unless you make an assumption. And this closure assumption can be made, for example, uh, in terms of the uh, Eddington tensor or also assuming that diffusion uh, gets to a threshold and it's limited. So there are different ways to, to the approximation, so to speak, to close uh, the, this, uh, to close this set of uh, actually in infinite equations that at some point you cut. Then there are uh, less uh, standard uh, or, or 
or less standard approaches that had to do with the uh, Fourier transforms, uh, unstructured grids, and another family uh, that uh, well, particularly, I, I particularly like because we, we develop uh, in our group uh, is the uh, working with statistical, is a statistical method based on Monte Carlo, uh, on, on the Monte Carlo approach, in which essentially you can, it's similar to ray tracing, but not exactly like that. So you uh, term, you treat the radiation field and the interaction with the, with the atoms in, um, in terms of, uh, of statistical sampling of some distribution function, physical distribution functions to obtain the, uh, to obtain the, the actual uh, radiation field uh, intensity. So how do we know which one is better? It's very hard because uh, uh, in order to, to, to know which uh, the, the, the strengths of, or, or drawbacks of each single implementation of the problem, <coughs> uh, essentially what you can do it's just to compare these this, uh, different strategies uh, among themselves. And uh, so this is, there's been a, what's called a two-cube uh, benchmark. There's been a, a, a comparison, a project that is aimed at comparing all these different codes. There were, uh, I guess, 11 codes that, that, uh, that um, participated into this uh, effort has been a huge effort. And so we selected, what we did is just to select three test problems and see how these 11 codes perform in each of them. And so the first that we have selected is the, uh, the point source problem that I, that I started from. Remember, they have a point source that sometimes is called a strong grain sphere. Uh, and so uh, we, have, we have been looking at what are the, uh, so these are three different codes that are given the following problem. You have a point source sitting here, you have a, a, a uniform homogeneous uh, gas around it. So the simplest possible problem, but in 3D, okay? So this is uh, already makes the problem a little bit uh, more complex, at least numerically. Um, and you see that these three codes, these are three, three different codes. Actually, these are the, probably the one that performed the best. I don't remember the names, but, uh, but you see that there are differences. You see how, for example, uh, the, this, this code here is producing all this fluffy thing uh, and also the, the contours here. These are uh, ionization fraction, okay? So where you see pink, it's... Uh, Neutral, when you see black, it's totally ionized and there are intermediate uh, stages. So clearly there are differences. And so this is uh, what we are trying to understand. And uh, it's important, this, this, this type of experiments are important for us to have a feeling of how the radiative transfer codes are performing because otherwise we would be just uh, waving in the dark <coughs> without knowing exactly which one is correct or not. So the second, uh, the second test that we perform is instead the, uh, we have a, a dense clump uh, sitting, uh, sitting here with the radiation uh, coming uh, from, from the left part of the, of the, um, of the, of the grid. And, and you see that they, we were looking after the shadow beyond, produced by, by the clump. So you have this radiation, and in principle you should have uh, the, the shape of the, of the clump, uh, the, the shape, sorry, of the shadow that, that is behind the clump. Uh, it's telling us uh, a lot about the uh, accuracy of the method. And again, you see that uh, there are differences. Uh, the, this one always performs a little bit uh, in a strange way, uh, but even there are also differences if you uh, look between these two. Uh, but overall, I would say that we are not very bad. Uh, and then we increase one step further the complexity, and then we just took a, a real uh, cosmological density field with fluctuation, inhomogeneities, all the, all we we can. Uh, I mean, a real situation. And now. Uh, we see that on average, I mean, the, the, three, the three shapes look pretty much the same, but if you look in the in details, uh, still uh, there are differences. Now, you see that these two cases look, these two codes perform uh, much more similar than that one, 
while before it was the opposite. So uh, that tells us that probably depending on, on, the, uh, on the physics that you have implemented in the, in the code and the numerical strategy that you're using, uh, then you may get somewhat different results. And this is uh, obviously, uh, if you want to do uh, precision uh, studies, then it may be, it may be a little bit of a problem. But the only way to make uh, progress is just to uh, truly compare and exchange information. So if we are happy with this uh, more or less, uh, I would say, 10% uh, level of, of agreement, uh, or actually of disagreement, uh, we, we could proceed and say, okay, we have details, but maybe radiative transfer, we more or less know how to do it, also in a cosmological context. <coughs> and so let's, let's be brave and try to go for the problem. So, realization. Uh, so now we are going to see uh, what uh, this, this uh, realization is expected to, to, to be uh, from uh, the, the most, sophisticated, most sophisticated uh, numerical simulation that we have available. Now, to explain this process, I will use uh, this, uh, in the next slides, I will use uh, this type of uh, uh, display, in the sense that there will be four panels. In each panel, I'll show a different quantity. So these are simulations that have been performed within uh, a, a commoving box of four megaparsecs, which is relatively small, but uh, as we will see later, the problem with ionization is that uh, radiation is produced by uh, even the tiniest galaxies. So they actually they are the more important, the most important galaxies that uh, for ionization are the small ones. I'll show you, we will come to that point later. So you want to resolve that in your simulation. So if you, if you take a box which is too large, which would be more representative, then you are missing, because of numerical resolution, these faint sources that you may be uh, completely wrong. So uh, we, we need to do relatively, if we, if we want to solve the problem exactly, we are limited in some, in some sense to uh, relatively small volumes. Anyway, this is just uh, pedagogical, just to see what, what is going on, so it's good. Now, this is the, in this panel, I'll show you the neutral fracture, so pink means uh, totally neutral, and when you see black, means that the gas has been ionized. Here we we'll see the, how the UV background that we introduced yesterday. So remember we have the intensity of the UV background uh, measured at uh, 1 Rydberg, 912 angstrom, uh, in units of 10 to the minus 21 Earth per second per Earth per, per square centimeter per steel radian, which is at the standard, uh, standard normalization. So we see it as a function of redshift. Here is the gas over density uh, or in the box, and this is the gas temperature with, that ranges from 1,000 to 10 to the 5 K. Uh, here in the center, you get uh, the scale factor, which is just the inverse of 1 plus Z. So let's start. So initially, uh, and this is reached around 15 or so, actually 12. Um, so you see that. Uh, First of all, the, the density here, you see there is a, a collapse structure, you know, this red thing where the density is high, that is among the first to form uh, stars uh, in this volume. So in this case, we are not including any other source, any source other than stars. Uh, so we are not including quasars or anything else. Uh, so it's a very uh, vanilla uh, model for realization. So, uh, this is the, uh, the stars, and you see that the stars are starting to produce this, this ionized bubble that is more or less spherical, as we said at the very beginning. So uh, it's, it's a round structure uh, that, that, it's, uh, that it's becoming larger and larger. You note know that the, uh, the green part here means that inside the bubble, the, ga the gas is rich at temperature 10 to the 4, which is the, uh, the dictated by the photoheating rate that we discussed yesterday. Uh, at the same time, the, the UV background has already uh, has increased, the intensity has increased to 10 to the minus 4 at this point, and so this is average over the box. Okay? So clearly inside here, the UV background is much larger than what we were discussing yesterday. So this is a, a, there are large fluctuations, of course, because this is much larger and this is much lower. This is almost zero, okay? So the mean is that value. So 
this is something to uh, be kept in mind. So as, as we uh, proceed, um, see that now other uh, sources start to, to produce uh, ionizing photons. And uh, see, the, uh, even around uh, small galaxies here, you see the tiny bubbles. But the bubbles uh, start to, to merge one with each other. And so the topology now becomes much more, uh, much more complex. Now, remember that these are, are, are cuts along uh, one, one, one uh, or 2D cuts around a 3D structure, which therefore in 3D can become very complex. Yes, please. <coughs> The two what? These two plus are on the same core. Yes, yes. Uh, so isn't it strange that sometimes this, they are not centered on the structure? That's a very good point, uh, and, and you're right. In fact, uh, actually, you see that, that, that probably, well, uh, almost for sure, I mean, this bubble is, is driven by this complex here, but it goes into that direction. You see why? Because look at this blue part here. Yeah, the density is very low. So uh, the ionization front proceeds into the voids where it's easier for the, the, the speed is higher because there are less recombination in the gas that can, be, can contrast the expansion. On, on the other side instead, you see there is a dense filament here that is probably blocking the expansion on the other side. So that's why it becomes asymmetric. So this is a very good point that, that, that you raised, actually. So. Uh, Yes, so we, we are seeing that. And so this process continues. Now, you see that the, the uh, UV background steadily uh, increased. Now we are around redshift 8 or so here. Uh, and the gas starts to, uh, to uh, be heated <coughs> to temperatures that are uh, even uh, on the order of 10 to the 4 in the ionized region, or a little bit even higher in, in the densest among, among these regions. So uh, we continue, and now you start to see uh, two things here. First is that uh, there's a switch in the topology. Okay, we start we're starting to see a switch in the topology. That means that while at the beginning we had isolated neutral, uh, isolated ionized region within a neutral hydrogen C. Now we are reversing the situation. So we have neutral islands. You see the, the pink islands that are embedded in the ionized gas. Okay? So because now most of the, uh, most of the uh, we, have, we have moved uh, beyond the 50% ionization uh, level on average. So we now have uh, neutral regions embedded in, in otherwise uh, ionized gas. And that means that uh, you see that the, there's a, a, an indication here that the UV background increases. That is because the mean free path of the ionizing photons can uh, start to become comparable to the size of the box. So uh, every point is seeing more or less a little bit of radiation because the mean free path is comparable to the size of the box. And so the, there's a sharp uh, increase in the uh, you see how, st how, steep the, how steeply the uh, UV background increases, and now it's truly uh, the, the situation has become even more dramatic. So now the, the, the gas has turned uh, completely, almost completely ionized. You see that blue corresponds to 10 to the minus 4. So only one atom in 10,000 is still neutral on average, but um, in these regions, 99.99% uh, .99 of, the, of the gas is, is now ionized. Uh, temperature has become uh, more or less uh, constant, 10 to the 4, with slight variations. And so uh, that process uh, continues. You see the, the islands, the neutral islands, shrink uh, and become, uh, they, are, they are now, um, uh, they are now, uh, how to say, they are they're only confined within the most densest regions where uh, the recombination rate, which is higher there, can keep the uh, little bit of neutral hydrogen. But these are uh, heated up by, by the uh, increasing intensity of the, of the radiation field. Because now each point sees all the sources, essentially, in the box. And, and therefore, finally, the final stage, you are left with these uh, filaments here that uh, are also 
neutral, essentially, oh, sorry, I also ionize uh, in one part to uh, 10,000, uh, but they, they retain a little bit of, they retain a little bit of, um, of gas. So these are the filaments that yesterday we saw as, a, as the, what we call the absorbers in the spectra of distant quasar. Remember that we were looking at the spectra of the quasar with all those lines. So these are exactly what is producing the lines in the, the absorption line in the quasar spectra that we have seen. And therefore, uh, at this point, uh, ionization is completed. Okay? So keep in mind that uh, there, there will be always a little bit uh, of neutral hydrogen, hydrogen hanging around, and of course there will be hydrogen in galaxies. Okay, so galaxies, even like uh, the Milky Way, our own galaxy, it, it's retaining a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of neutral hydrogen. But this is because the the density, the mean density in the galaxy is one million times higher than the cosmic mean. So there, there is no way that the that the UV background can. Uh, can compete with recombination, so the gas, the gas remains, uh, remains neutral. So uh, in, in, in 3D, we, what we have seen are just 2D slides uh, uh, through the slices through the, through the box, but in 3D you may, uh, you, can, you can imagine at this point what the topology could be, so you have these uh, tiny bubbles that uh, in a hierarchically grow because they, they grow by, by merging, so they merge with each other and, and form larger, larger complexes, and uh, eventually all, all, the, all the gas will be, uh, will be fully, fully ionized. Now, uh, as I already said before, now we, we can go back for a second to our picture of the uh, absorption lines <coughs> in the quasar spectra. And uh, having uh, understood exactly how reionization proceeds, we can also uh, have a clear view uh, of, we can interpret almost directly the spectra of the quasar. Now, consider that, uh, that you are looking at, the, at the, uh, a, a light cone uh, uh, that is being reionized like the one that we have just seen, a volume that is being reionized uh, from this side. So if you have a, a quasar that is located uh, after, so redshift increases in that towards the right, okay? So if you have a source like a quasar that is sitting here in the already ionized gas, uh, then what we see is the Lyman alpha forest. Okay, so we see all this. Uh, this is the Lyman the Lyman limit, and so these are all the the um, uh, absorption line features impressed by this uh, fluctuating uh, structure of filaments in which we have a uh, little bit of hydrogen left. Now, if you start to put your uh, quasar to higher range, for example, then what you see is that the line uh, passes through regions where the, uh, where the gas is already ionized within these bubbles, or uh, passes through regions to the neutral islands. And uh, these two type of uh, situations imprint uh, different, different uh, type of records on the, on the spectrum. So in this case, we would have, again, uh, a Lyman alpha forest uh, type absorption, but also we have neutral patches here that block completely the, uh, the flux, okay? So the flux is totally absorbed. And so we have what is called patchy absorption with some uh, gaps here uh, that are intermixed with uh, transmissivity windows uh, where the flux can be, uh, can be transmitted. And of course, if you, if you put your, your source a sufficiently high redshift, then uh, you have what is called the uh, gum peterson trough. Uh, it's uh, totally black, so the, the, the spectrum becomes uh, completely, completely uh, obscure. And so uh, we can uh, go back also to the, the, the figure that I showed yesterday, <coughs> because now it becomes also more clear what is happening. So uh, this high redshift quasar, you see that here that we are in the regime where uh, we are almost completely blocked. We have a, a gum peterson trough. But uh, depending on the direction, uh, you can have regions where uh, you have uh, transmission uh, or absorption, uh, depending on, on, on the fact that uh, in different directions, the, uh, the, depending on the line of sight, we can pass through uh, a region which is still patchy or maybe in another one which is fully ionized, like, for example, if you pass here, you can go up to this redshift by uh, always staying in within the ionized gas. 
So there is uh, also variability in the, in the uh, value of the gamma peterson uh, optical depth as a function of direction in the sky or, or the source that you, are, that you are considering, depending if the source is embedded or not in the uh, neutral or ionized, uh, ionized gas. Now, uh, so this is what, what is uh, happening uh, in terms of the global topological properties of ionization. <clears throat> but now we have never touched upon what is really uh, producing, producing uh, these ionizing photons that are required. So far we have only assumed that there are photons produced by some type of source, <coughs> uh, typically in the uh, collapse uh, parts of the, the collapse structures of the, of the universe. Now, uh, so the, 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 the source list, we, uh, the, just to tell you briefly, so we don't know, we don't know what the answer is yet. We have some, some ideas, we have uh, feelings and also uh, hypotheses, but uh, to, to tell you the truth, uh, as, we, as we speak, uh, there is no uh, complete consensus on what the sources of ionization uh, are, and that uh, requires uh, definitely more, more work. <laughs> but uh, the most natural choice would be uh, to use stars, okay? Stars are, are uh, the, uh, the most uh, natural way to, uh, to produce uh, photons, and in particular ionizing photons. But uh, stars uh, come in different flavors. And in particular, we know that, um, that initially uh, the, uh, the gas in the, in the, in the universe was uh, left by, from, by the Big Bang nucleosynthesis in a primordial composition state that is made only of hydrogen and helium. So uh, there are reasons to think that the stars that form out of this pristine gas have properties that are very different from the ones that form today, okay? And in particular, uh, the, the, the differences are so important that people uh, found different names for these two types of stars. Uh, so they, are, uh, they could come as present-day stars are usually termed uh, population two stars, meaning they are already uh, enriched with, with uh, heavy elements that change dramatically their properties, as we'll see in a second. With respect to the population three stars that refer to the first stars that formed, so stars that form uh, with a, with an almost uh, primordial composition out of uh, uh, hydrogen and helium. Now, uh, not only this is the, the first difference. So, uh, not only you can have a star with or without heavy elements that would make it a pop two or pop three stars. But you can also uh, have pop three stars. There are theories that, that um, predict that uh, the first stars, if you form a star out of this, um, out of this uh, primordial composition gas, the star could be much more massive than the star that we see today. So pop three stars can also come in the massive flavor or a normal flavor. Now, uh, there, uh, there are reasons to, <coughs> to, to, to explain why this could be. Maybe uh, I'm not sure we have uh, time to discuss it today in this lecture, but certainly it's, a, it's an open possibility. Now, how does this affect uh, realization? Remember that, well, first of all, the, the two populations may be coeval because in some parts of the universe you may still have uh, some primordial composition gas out of which a population tree star can form. Somewhere else you may have, uh, in the dense regions where, for example, as we have seen before, where ionization starts, uh, the stars that are produced there start to pollute the gas with heavy elements and therefore you would form pop two stars. So at the same time in the universe you can form both. So the question is in what proportion are you producing pop three stars versus pop two stars at each redshift. This is something we don't know. But uh, the, the key point, even perhaps even more important, is that uh, a key quantity that, that we need to, uh, in our uh, realization simulation is to, to know how many photons do I produce per baryon that I put in a given, in, in a given type of star. So, uh, this is, these are the numbers that, that we get for the 
for three cases. So for a, a standard pop today, a standard population to start with uh, an initial mass function that is uh, saltpeter, if you know what it is. So it's a power law distribution of the stellar masses that is commonly observed in, 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 our, in our galaxies and in the, in the local universe. So for this type of stars, normal stars, you, uh, for each baryon that you put in that star, you would get 4,000 photos, 4,000 ionizing photons, okay? So uh, for each baryon that you put there, the uh, nuclear reaction will act in such a way that it produces uh, 4,000 uh, ionizing photons. For uh, population three stars, if they have the same uh, mass distribution, the same salpeter initial mass function, then instead you would get something like 30,000, okay? So uh, this is uh, is simply because, uh, I mean, a zero order is because if you have a population three star, uh, because of the absence of, of uh, metals, the star becomes hotter because uh, remember that metals produce that cooling function that, that we uh, discussed yesterday. So in the absence of metals, the star is hotter, and because it's hotter, it's producing more ionizing UV radiation and ionizing photons. So there's a factor of more than 10 if you use population three stars instead of pop two stars. And even more, if the stars are masses, massive as predicted by uh, some, uh, well, b by several studies. Uh, so they have masses instead of 10 solar masses, they have masses of 100 solar masses typically, then you get an incredible amount of, uh, of photos, so 100,000. Okay? So 25 times more photons than the stars that we see today. So uh, obviously population three stars would be the best possible ionizer that you can think of. But the question is for how long do they, they live, uh, and for how long the, uh, their production can be continued because the universe is getting uh, ionized. So stars, uh, you see already from here, what is the variety of choices that you have and what are the implications of those choices. So the second, uh, <coughs> the second uh, type of source is it's quasar. Now, quasars, differently from stars, do not get their uh, uh, radiation output from the uh, conversion of gravitation into nuclear, into nuclear energy, but uh, they uh, use uh, gravitational uh, accretion uh, onto a compact source, which typically is a black hole. So this gas is getting hot and uh, radiation uh, is emitted. Now, the problem with quasars, at least the quasar that, that, we, uh, that we know and we observe, is that, that these are very rare objects. So, uh, for example, a redshift six, the quasar that I showed you before from which we get this, those nice spectra, uh, are very rare. And by rare, I mean there is typically one of such quasar per gigaparsec cube, okay? So the, the number density of this quasar is it's very, it's very uh, small, a redshift six, and even worse, is dropping as you go to higher redshift. So the quasar that we know are probably uh, too rare, or they, if you prefer, they come too late on the scene when, when realization has already uh, happened. However, uh, as we were discussing yesterday, they, they could be important for the other, uh, the, type of realization, which is the, the helium realization that has occurred later. And uh, as you know, um, the, re the ionization potential for helium is four times that of hydrogen, so it's for Rydbergs, and that requires uh, sources that have uh, a hard spectra, that a lot of uh, high energy photos like, like quasars. So quasars probably are not that important for uh, realization of hydrogen, but it could be important for realization of helium. Now, uh, supernovae. Supernovae can also, uh, as you know, the massive stars at the end of their life, they produce, uh, they explode, and by exploding, they produce something similar to the, uh, to the bubbles that we saw before. So these are bubbles of uh, uh, shock-heated gas with, uh, where the gas goes to temperature of 10 to the 6 uh, K, or so 1 million degrees, so it's very hot. Um, and, and the gas, of course, is ionized. So in principle, theoretically, you, can, you could, uh, you could uh, think that uh, reionization has occurred uh, by, by, uh, due to the um, 
fact that the, that the bubbles of, uh, produced by the supernovae fill the, fill the volume. However, <coughs> it's, if you think for a second, uh, this hypothesis is not very uh, uh, suitable because the, uh, uh, the, the size of the bubble driven by shocks is much smaller than the size of the, of the bubbles produced by uh, ionizing radiation. And of course, and the reason is that, uh, that for, if you want to uh, shock heat the gas, you have to move around large amounts of, of gas, and that limits the, uh, li this is very energy consuming. So at the end of the day, the, the size of the volume that you can affect uh, with supernova explosion is much smaller than the one that you can affect with radiation. Uh, in addition, uh, there is another problem with uh, with this uh, supernova uh, hypothesis that has to do with the distortions of the cosmic microwave background that are produced by this hot gas. So what happens is that uh, if you produce these uh, million degrees bubbles around uh, each galaxy, essentially, then the CMB photons that could uh, that pass through, through this, um, to these bubbles and as they are coming towards us, are um, uh, the exchange energy with the hot gas and, and, and so they acquire energy, the CMB photo acquire energy from the thermal energy of the gas. This is called the thermal uh, sunyaya zeldovich effect. And so it, you would produce distortions in the CMB spectrum, which uh, it's, it's not, that are not observed so far, or at least we have upper limits. So there's a limit on that. Uh, if you want to do it in that way, you have to solve this problem. Then uh, we can go to, uh, to more uh, exotic but uh, uh, equally interesting uh, hypothesis. So you may say that uh, there are several uh, uh, theories that predict that uh, dark matter particle may uh, annihilate or decay uh, into a number of, uh, of products, and in particular high energy particles, that uh, could produce uh, a, a ionization shower. We will come back to this point tomorrow while discussing the 21 centimeter because that is uh, actually 21 centimeter is one of the uh, possibly more pro most promising ways to study uh, this type of uh, process of the dark matter annihilation. Therefore, to study the nature of dark matter, we'll see it tomorrow. But um, in terms of ionization, uh, uh, in practice, it's very, it's, uh, well, you can have a little bit of uh, uh, ionization added. There is an upper bound. Of course, it depends on many details, but typically many or most models that have studied these things uh, tend to say that the, the electron scattering optical depth that you produce, so the amount of free electrons uh, that you produce is, uh, is very limited. So you can, you can get to uh, a full uh, realization purely with dark matter without violating a, a number of other constraints. But certainly, uh, if dark matter is there and is producing this type of uh, uh, process, then it will be possible to uh, use that to infer something about the nature of dark matter. Uh, then there's another class of uh, objects that are called uh, mini quasar. So these are, uh, the, the physics is similar to, to that of, of, of quasars, but uh, as I was telling before, this, the, the quasar that we observe are very rare, but keep in mind that this redshift 6 quasar are already very massive. So the quasar that we are talking here have masses of 10 to the 9 solar masses or so. So we think that they must have had some uh, ancestor, some progenitor in the, in the hierarchical merger uh, framework of mind. Uh, and so there must be some other uh, quasar that are very faint that we cannot see yet but they could uh, produce uh, uh, radiation. So mini quasar are quasar powered by black holes that, are, uh, that have masses of the order 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 solar masses. So they are not as massive as a billion solar mass uh, quasar, but yet they, they produce some, uh, if, they are, if they are in sufficient numbers, they could produce uh, a lot of X-ray radiation uh, that, uh, that uh, could, could uh, produce substantial uh, ionization. So in this class, uh, in this class of sources, I also uh, implicitly include uh, even more. Uh, I mean, uh, 
complex systems like uh, the high-mass X-ray binaries that are, uh, com uh, there are binary systems in which you have a black hole uh, and a neutron star or in various combinations that they also produce X-rays. Uh, so there is a limit on the amount of, of, of X-rays that you can produce <clears throat> uh, and this is uh, set by the, uh, the X-ray background. So you don't want to produce too many X-rays at high redshift that you exceed the X-ray background that you observe. So there are constraints also on that. And if you satisfy that limit, <coughs> you're bound, uh, depending on the spectrum that you assume, I, I have to say, to uh, provide only three photon per barrier in the IGM in 10 saltpeter times. The saltpeter time is the time that the black hole uh, takes, that takes to, for a black hole to double its mass due to accretion. So there are only three photon per baryons, uh, and, and as we have seen before, if the clumping factor is, is uh, substantial, this may not be enough because you have to beat also uh, recombination. So it's not enough to give one photon per baryon usually because recombination brings you back to neutral and then you have to give another photon. So uh, three photons are at the bare uh, limit if you include uh, recombinations. And finally, the, the very uh, final possible source of ionizing photons is, uh, as we were discussing also yesterday, is structure formation. So, so you have uh, this uh, virialization shocks that, that shock hit the gas due to structure formation and they start to eat it up so it's, the gas is collisionally ionized. Again, this comes a little bit too, uh, too late, uh, uh, redshift below redshift five or six. Uh, and and uh, therefore it could be again important for helium two reionization. Uh, this is bram stralung emission from the hot plasma created by the structure formation. The nice thing is that in this case, you don't have to care about the uh, escape fraction that we were discussing before because this is automatically uh, equal to one because this hot gas is optically thin. So radiation produced can flow away almost, uh, almost directly. Now, uh, so as I said before, there are so many uncertainties. You see only from this list that you don't know what, what are the sources. And even if you take the simplest hypothesis, there are stars. There could be many options that you have available. Uh, and, and therefore, it's, it's very hard to, to fix down the, uh, the problem purely from theoretical uh, princi first principle, in first theoretical principle. So uh, we need to uh, constantly be in contact with the data and, and the experiments just to fix these, these numbers. So uh, the first thing that we can, uh, that we can uh, consider here is uh, what do we get the information that we need. So suppose you have developed your, your best uh, uh, fiducia model for organization. How do you know if that model is correct or not? You have to make predictions and compare them with the data. So what are the data? The primary data that, that, uh, that we can use is, is the cosmic microwave background. So why do we care about the cosmic microwave background? Because the cosmic microwave background is uh, strongly affected by uh, reionization in several ways, and there are at least, uh, at least three ways in which it could be affected. There are also others, but these are the, the basic ones that, that uh, are mostly used. So the first effect of, re of changing reionization history, so reionization history is the way in which reionization proceeds as a function of time, is uh, to damp the primary anisotropies of the CMB on all scales, okay? We will go through this point now in detail, but let me uh, just list them. So the first, you have a damping of the primary anisotropy of the CMB on all scales. The second is that you create new anisotropies that would not be there in the absence of, uh, if reionization would have not occurred, uh, and these are typically found uh, on small scales, uh, so large multiple numbers. And for this reason, they are called secondary because they are not in the primary spectrum, but they are produced as the photons travel towards us. And so this is the effect that is called the patchy reionization anisotropies. <coughs> 
Uh, and third is uh, realization also affects the uh, large scale polarization signal of, of the CMB. Uh, and this is because the, uh, there's an interaction between the, 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 the fact that an electron uh, scatters the uh, CMB, a free electron produced by ionization scatters the uh, CMB radiation and it reflecting the, the, because of the fact that you have a quadrupole anisotropy in the CMB, also uh, that induces a polarization uh, signal in the CMB, which is a clear signature of ionization. So the key quantity when we discuss uh, uh, the effects of uh, the link between uh, reionization and the CMB is, of course, is the abundance of free electrons. So reionization is a machine that creates free electrons. So the free electrons are, uh, uh, are produced by reionization, and the, all the effects that we can measure on the CMB depend on the depth of, of this uh, uh, free electron layer as a function of redshift. So how thick is this, this uh, reionization uh, layer is that, of course, uh, depends on the reionization history, right? Because if you start, the earlier you start reionization, the thicker this layer is from, from us and the CMB. So there's a layer in between us and the CMB, and the thickness depends on reionization. So the earlier you start, the thicker is the reionization layer. So this is quantified but the quantity that is called the, uh, the electron scattering optical depth. So this is indicated like tau E, and it's a function of the reionization uh, redshift. Now you may ask me, what is the reionization redshift? Now, uh, this is a tricky question, and there's a lot of debate also. Uh, there's also, I was, should say, also a little bit of confusion in the literature because uh, the optical depth that you measure, in principle, should be <coughs> the, uh, the beginning of reionization, so the, the, the moment at which you start to form electrons, okay, due to reionization, so from, from, uh, from the early redshift at which you can uh, produce reionization. However, uh, People doing the CMB often uh, don't, when, when they model the effects of ionization on CMB, uh, they, they don't want to deal with all the intricacies of ionization. So what they usually do is assume that, that ionization, of course, is a step function. Okay? This is a very crude assumption for all the, what we have seen before. We have seen that the ionization is a very gradual process, also very extended, but you know, for the data, uh, for the CMB interpretation, often uh, people are using uh, reionization redshift as, the, uh, as a step, uh, the position of a step function where the, uh, where the uh, gas turns from neutral to ionized. But anyway, whatever you choose to, for that ratio, I mean, the, the, the physical choice would be uh, exactly to, uh, to model things like that, in which uh, we model the uh, optical depth as the, um, essentially the product of the number density of uh, el free electrons, which is a function of redshift, if you assume that the realization occurs in a gradual manner. And then uh, the Thomson uh, uh, cross-section for the scattering of photons uh, on by electrons themselves. And then uh, you have uh, the cosmological path, essentially. All this would be CDT, right? So uh, written in terms of redshift. But, so it's uh, NE times sigma times CDT, the, the radial path length of the, of the photons. So this is a, a quantity. That, uh, that you can uh, write in a, in a more uh, useful or transparent way. So uh, this formula can, can, uh, can be uh, written like, uh, like this. So we have, uh, uh, again, the various uh, parameters, the cosmological parameters, omega baryon and omega matter, which enter through uh, essentially H. And... Uh, Though we have the critical density and this Y are the helium uh, abundance in mass and in number with respect to hydrogen. So these are numbers that this would be 0.24 and this is, would be 8%. So this is the, we correct for helium, okay, as usual. And so we have uh, 
a, a behavior that goes like 1 plus z to 3 halves. So uh, the optical depth <laughs> that, is, that can be derived from CMB experiments it's uh, as a very simple expression. So if you uh, factorize all this, these numbers of the parameters, you get uh, that by redshift 7, you would expect uh, to have a, 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 an optical depth of the order of uh, uh, 5%. Okay? And that increases with uh, power 1.5 or 3 halves. So the higher is the redshift at which you uh, start ionization, the higher is the optical depth that you get. And therefore, the higher and the stronger would be the effect of the ionization on the CMB. So remember that I told you there are these three effects. So the damping, on the, on the, on the damping of the anisotropies, secondary anisotropies, and, uh, and the um, uh, large-scale polarization signal. So this is an example of what happens to the, to the CMB as you fix all the parameters and you only change the value of tau e, the electron scattering, okay? So uh, the, the points are the data points here, and the red curve is the, uh, what you would expect if, in addition to the, uh, to the uh, primary anisotropies, you add this layer of free electrons that is damping uh, the anisotropies. You see that we are going here from, from value of zero to very large value, which is of the order of two. So it's a very strong ionization. By the way, <clears throat> the previous formula give us a little bit of, a, for example, if you say uh, it's roughly if you, a rule of thumb that I personally use but is, is that uh, the realization redshift is essentially uh, the value of tau multiplied by 100. So 5% is roughly 5 or 6, and 2, 0.2 will be 20. So if you're using here a tau of 2, that will be a very, a very uh, high redshift of realization. Now, you see how, uh, in principle, we can, we can uh, derive the value of tau uh, and therefore learn about realization from the study of the, of the CMB. Of course, the, uh, this is an ideal situation in which the uh, optical depth is very large. But because we are dealing with, uh, with uh, values that are much smaller than what we see here, this effect is very it's, it's uh, within the uh, measurement errors. So it's very hard to use the damping as a, uh, as, a, as a precise measurement of tau e. And in fact, we can only get right now uh, very loose upper limits that tells us that uh, ionization has occurred uh, below ratio 20 or so. <clears throat> So uh, it's not, this, this in principle is possible, but this is not the best way to do it. The best way to do it probably using the CMB is with the uh, second and the third method. Uh, the, second <coughs> the second method is the uh, production of uh, secondary anisotropies in the CMB due to the, um, due to the uh, patchy, patchy structure, patchy morphology of the ionization, which is made of by all this bubble. This effect is called the uh, kinetic Sunia Zeldovich effect, and uh, essentially has again to do with the fact that the, uh, that the photons of the CMB are interacting with, the, uh, with electrons that have a velocity that it's uh, due to the peculiar motion of the gas that is uh, dictated by structure formation, okay? So uh, I'll come back to this point more formally in a second. But so let's see what, uh, at least qualitatively, what is happening. So this is a busy figure, so let me go uh, through it slowly. So this is the power spectrum of the CMB as a function of the uh, multiple uh, moment. Now, note that we are uh, dealing here with scales. Uh, they are much smaller than the one that we were looking before. So we are talking here with uh, values of the multiple uh, of the order 1,000 to 10,000. So this is the small scale part of the, of the CMB spectrum. And uh, as, you, as we know, the, the, the primary spectrum, which is the, which is the uh, red line, drops down because of the process that is known as silk damping. So uh, the suppression of small-scale uh, anisotropies due to the uh, 
photon diffusion essentially. So the, the primary spectrum is decreasing, okay? Uh, and then we have data points here. Look at the points uh, that, that are uh, measurements. These are measured uh, by uh, the Atacama telescope. Uh, the, it's called ACT at two different frequencies, uh, 148 gigahertz and 211 gigahertz. Now you see the points here that have been measured, these two frequencies, and so you see that uh, they follow the, the CMB, but then they diverge, okay? So uh, they diverge and they, they go up. So this extra signal is produced by, uh, essentially, has nothing to do with the CMB, but it's produced by galaxies, uh, in particular infrared sources that are emitting at this, at this uh, frequency. So if you take the power spectrum of this galaxy distribution, you get a spectrum which is done like that, which is made by, uh, again, a shot noise component, which is a power law here, and the clustering component that it's uh, underneath the, uh, the CMB. Then we have also uh, radio sources here, so galaxies that are emitting in radio. And finally, we have the signal that we are after, okay? So this is the signal produced by uh, reionization with all the free electrons that, that we have uh, available that combine uh, to produce the signal, which is the sum of both the thermal and the kinetic Sunyazerdovich effect. So if we want to uh, dig out this signal, we, uh, well, the signal is there in the CMB. You see that actually here would be, uh, without these foregrounds, so the, this extra contamination from the uh, infrared uh, galaxies, we would be able to find a very clean window here because the CMB has dropped down and uh, so we only are left with the uh, CMB signal produced by uh, the patch reionization. So it would be a perfect uh, experiment to, to perform. So how do we uh, compute the, 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 power, the power spectrum due to the uh, kinetic Sunya Zeldovich? Well, it's uh, very simple. It's just uh, the, uh, you have to take essentially the Fourier transform of the, uh, of the temperature fluctuation induced by the uh, electron scattering in a given direction. And it's a calculation similar to what we have done before for the uh, electron scattering that enters in this form, in this exponential year. So you can compute the delta T, the fluctuation induced by, uh, by the fact that there is a coupling uh, between the electrons and the CMB photons, and you have to take care of the component uh, uh, of the peculiar velocity of this gas along the line of sight, where you use the line of sight through which you're uh, uh, looking at the, at the fluctuations. Then you transform that and you get the, uh, the, uh, the power spectrum. So uh, now, can we uh, look at that? Yeah, yes, yes, I'm almost done. So yes, we can, we can, uh, we can uh, look at this. And uh, we have to keep in mind, though, that uh, there is a, when we compute the Sunyazeldovich effect, uh, another, another point uh, comes into play. That is the fact that uh, galaxies not only emit uh, UV radiation, but also they emit X-rays. Uh, and as I'll show you in a second, this X-ray is also is something that we also need to include in our realization calculation because they change dramatically the morphology, as I'll show you in a second, of the, of the uh, realization history. So the simulation that I showed before did not include X-rays, but if you want to compute particularly the Sunyazeldovich effect, it's very important that we include that for reasons that, I, uh, that I, I'm going to tell you in one sec. So, there is a relation between the luminosity and the star formation rate in the X-ray band. And so you, you take this for granted. This is obtained at a redshift zero. And with some prescription, you also uh, assume that it, go, that it works at, at high redshift. And so uh, depending on how much of these X-rays you have in your, in your simulation, things change. Because so this is the same. This is a, a realization simulation. Now you have a, a light cone. And the, this is a 700 uh, megaparsecs. These are very large-scale simulations as a function of redshift. So white here is neutral, black is ionized. And so this is the case, essentially the case that I showed you before, in which X-rays are 
are zero or are negligible, which is the fiducial case. But because we don't know how many X-rays are present there, you remember that I told you it could be uh, quasars, I, I mass X-ray binaries. So if you uh, allow as much X-rays uh, as uh, is, uh, is allowed by the soft X-ray background that I was discussing before, then you see that the, uh, the, struct, the morphology of uh, reionization becomes from very grainy to very smoothed, okay? So in this case, it's very smoothed. So when you compute the, uh, the kinetic Sunyai-Zeldovich effect, the different smoothness of the, of the reionization has a very strong impact on the power spectrum that you would compute. So this is, the, again, the power spectrum of the, of the kinetic Sunyai-Zeldovich in the multiple 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4. So the fiducial case, the one that we have been discussing so far, is the black curve. But if you add X-rays, you depress this, this power spectrum, and uh, you can get down to the purple, the purple line. And this is exactly because X-rays tend to smooth out all this, uh, this, uh, the, the, the struct, the morphology and the topology of reionization. So it becomes mu a much more smoother process, much less uh, dependent on the position. Uh, and so for that reason, the power spectrum uh, loses, uh, become, the intensity of the power spectrum becomes uh, lower, and the, actually uh, we can constrain, uh, f the, the, there's something funny here, because the, the actual data, if you assume that there is no contribution from the, uh, from the infrared sources that are contaminating the signal, would be very close to, uh, to the extreme, or would favor a model in which there is a lot of X-rays. Of course, the, 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 the signal that is coming from the sources, I mean, remember those sources that I was telling you before? So these are, I mean, all these sources here are contaminating the signal, so we are not sure if we can subtract them well enough. But if there is a contribution from the sources in the data, then the, the data point um, goes up here, and so even the fiducial model, it's, uh, it's uh, allowed. So depending uh, on the, this is a problem with the data. So the models are here, the, the, the prediction is very clear, but what the data is telling us is, is still yet a little bit uh, uncertain. Uh, so this is, uh, the secondary anisotropy is a, is a very good way to study the, to study reionization. Um, and uh, the, for the third, uh, the third, uh, the third way to, to use the CMB, uh, I have to uh, defer it to tomorrow. Uh, and, and then we, in addition to the CMB tomorrow, we will also learn how to use uh, 21 centimeter observation to do a very detailed job on the study of realization. So I'll stop here for today. <laughs>